now. Um, and let's go ahead and start. I know people will still be trickling in. It is a Friday after all, first Friday in fall. And th for those that don't know me, my name is Liza Fakeo. I'm with the US Forest Service International Programs, and I help run the Beyond Trees Network, which is a global network of learning and exchange, and primarily by um, folks on the ground, NGOs, educators, youth, community organizers, anyone can be a member. Um, and in the chat, I think a lot of you already have uh, shown us or written in where you're from. Please note that this session, like all others, will be recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channels of beyondtrees.net. Um, and uh, let's see. So I wanted to start everything off before we begin with this panel discussion with a little anecdote. What you're seeing is Smoky Mountain. It's in the Philippines. In 1983, the opposition leader to our former dictator, so I grew up in the Philippines, um, Ferdinand Marcos was the dictator at that time, and the opposition leader was assassinated. My father was very, very close to him. And as a result of that assassination, the country and all the folks that supported uh, the opposition leader, Nino Aquino, they had multiple protests and that was the beginning of the end for the Marcos regime. I was, a few years later, I was 10 and my um, parents who were activists, they decided to take me, not my brother, my, me, um, and put me in the back of a pickup truck and took me to one of the major protests. And we wound our way through city streets, yelling and screaming, and I was just watching. And we went through Smoky Mountain. And it was an image that was permanently fixed in my head. Some t a few decades later, Smoky Mountain was closed. But it wasn't really close because most of the garbage was transferred to another place that they called the Promised Land. It was in Pattaya, in Quezon City, the largest city in the Philippines. And Pattaya, or the Promised Land, as it was called, was because the government decided that with developers that they would build homes there on top of a 50 meter high mountain of waste. 800 people live there, 100 or so families. And in the late 1990s, due to heavy rains, what should happen? There was a major landslide of trash. Now, a lot of the families that live there, they really depended on scavenging for money. They also depended on the landfill for food. And that was the, actually the scene that I saw at Smoky Mountain was of a little kid eating food and I was so perplexed by it. And that was what my parents were fighting against. So the landslide happened and 200 people perished. And still to this day, there are mountains of trash upon which and on which people depend for survivability. But we all know what that means in terms of health, in terms of pollution, to the waterways, to the soil, to air. We all know what that means too, if you take away the very thing that people depend on because they have nothing else to depend on. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this is only in the Philippines. We're seeing this everywhere. And I, this is where the panel discussion comes in and why we're talking about this, because we wanna know if this can be solved. We're looking at it from an, a forestry point of view. We want to take a look at it from the community engagement point of view, the tree planting point of view, clean up and the next generation point of view. And we have with us today a great panel to begin this discussion, a discussion that I don't think is going to end at the end of this two hours. 
So today, I'll transfer this over quite soon to Dr. Ron Zalesny and Liz Rogers with the U.S. Forest Service, who'll give us the big picture. Then I'll introduce our other panelists from around the world, from Tunisia, Indonesia, India, and Peru. And I think we can all find something in common in terms of challenges, but possibly also in terms of solutions. And we can start that dialogue together. And we want you to be part of it. So with that, I want to turn this over to Liz Rogers with the U.S. Forest Service to introduce herself, and then she'll pass it on to Ron. Liz, you're more than welcome. All right, thank you. I'll start sharing my screen. Can everyone see the presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Liza, for sharing your experience with us. I, I thought that was a very powerful way to begin our discussion today. Um, my name is Liz Rogers, and I'm a Pathways intern with the USDA Forest Service. And today, I will be presenting along with my colleague, Ron Zalesny, on using trees to green and clean sites of waste dumping. I want to begin by first thanking Liza and the Beyond Trees Network for this opportunity to present and to engage in this discussion and learn from each other and collaborate, as well as the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative for providing base funding for us to establish our sites, our fighter remediation sites, and without which our work would not be possible. And I would also like to thank the USDA Forest Service for internal support, as well as our collaborators listed below, our partners who have contributed substantial resources and partnerships to our efforts. So I would like to start off a little bit with my background and what brought me here. I have experience in education as well as environmental science that um, these experiences have built my passions for working in research and doing education and outreach. And I'm particularly passionate about where education and science and research can come together. So the nexus to me is science education and outreach. And I get very excited whenever I get to work in this nexus. And I'm specifically interested in waste management coming from the perspective that our actions that we take today can have uh, lasting impacts and they can impact generations for years to come. And so I wanna be a part of a positive impact with making actions today regarding waste management. And to set the stage for the rest of our talk, I'd like to define phytotechnologies, which is a broad umbrella that not only encompasses the work that Ron and I do with phytoremediation, but it encompasses in general using plants for environmental purposes. And so defined by the International Phytotechnology Society, phytotechnologies are the strategic use of plants to solve environmental problems by remediating qualities and quantities of our soil, water, and air resources, and also by restoring ecosystem services in managed landscapes. And phytotechnologies like these can be incredibly powerful, especially where our networks come together and interact. As you can see here, our green networks, our urban forests, school yards, open spaces, places that are vegetated and natural, where they come together with our blue networks or our water networks, lakes, ponds, rivers, et cetera, where these green and blue networks come together with the gray engineered networks. So areas within cities like utility corridors, sewage treatment facilities, highways, streets, where these networks come together is where we can have some of the largest impacts by implementing phytotechnologies. <clears throat> I have some examples of phytotechnologies that we can go into. First is green roofs, or otherwise known as eco roofs, which are a layer of vegetation planted over a waterproofing system that's installed on top of a flat or slightly sloped roof. And benefits from green roofs can include 
economic benefits from energy savings, <clears throat> excuse me, because green roofs can help insulate buildings, as well as improve property values, um, improved air quality from the vegetation, as well as providing urban amenities, such as places to um, recreate, as well as to maybe grow some vegetables or flowers in an otherwise urban environment. Another phytotechnology that exists at the nexus of these three networks are stormwater wetlands, otherwise known as constructed wetlands, <clears throat> which are treatment systems that use natural processes involving wetland vegetation, soils, and their associated microbial assemblages to improve water quality. And so the benefits of implementing stormwater wetlands or constructed wetlands include improved water quality as well as supporting wildlife habitat. And this is a cost-effective and feasible way to treat stormwater or wastewater, as opposed to other treatment options. This using plants is cost-effective and it's also aesthetically pleasing and it's, it can increase the biodiversity of a space in ways that traditional treatment just cannot. And then another phytotechnology is bio, bio soils, which are strips of vegetated areas that redirect and filter stormwater. So you might have seen these in cities that you've been in. Um, a typical bio soil is a long linear strip of vegetation in an urban setting used to collect runoff water from large impermeable surfaces. So uh, the principle of a bio soil is that the vegetation and the soils within allow, they kind of trap the water as it's flowing and they allow it to infiltrate, which helps to filter the water and filter pollutants out. So the longer that the water is held onto by the trees or the plants or the soil, the longer the, um, the water and the pollutants are in contact with the roots and the soil, which can help filter them. And this is also a low cost alternative to other treatment facilities and it generally has simple and quick implementation as well as being aesthetically pleasing. And finally, I would like to introduce the phytotechnology that we are focusing on today, phytoremediation, which is the use of trees to clean up contaminated soils and waters. And I'm going to go over some of the processes and mechanisms of phytoremediation and give some kind of definitions because that will help set the stage for Ron's talk on phytoremediation case studies. First, we have phytoextraction, which is the uptake of contaminants from the soil by plant roots, followed by the translocation of those pollutants into above ground plant tissue or below ground root tissue. So this is the uptake. Phytoextraction, extracting the pollutants from the soil. Next is phytodegradation. So phyto, the root having to do with plants or trees, and then degradation to degrade or break down pollutants. It's also referred to as phytotransformation and involves the degradation of complex organic molecules to simple molecules, and then followed by the incorporation of these simple molecules into plant tissues. Next is rhizodegradation, which is also known as phytostimulation. And rhizodegradation refers to the breakdown of contaminants specifically within the root zone. So rhizosphere, the root zone. And rhizodegradation is carried out by bacteria or other microorganisms whose numbers flourish in the rhizosphere. Phytovolatilization, so volatilizing the contaminants. It's the process of pollutant absorption by plants, followed by volatilization into the atmosphere by the foliar system, by the leaves. So the pollutants are being taken up <clears throat> and modified in a way that allows the plant to volatilize them as it is transpiring. <clears throat> and all of these processes that I'm describing are pollutant specific. So for instance, if we were interested in targeting heavy metals, 
phytovolatilization would not be occurring because heavy metals would not be volatilized by the plant, whereas organic contaminants could be. And lastly is phytostabilization, which is the reduction in mobility and bioavailability of pollutants in the environment, which can either be caused by physical or chemical effects. So physically, the tree roots or plant roots are holding the soil in place and they can hold the pollutants in place. Maybe the pollutants are adsorbing onto the roots. And so they're stuck there. They're not as mobile in the environment where they could flow with groundwater into um, freshwater resources and contaminate them. Instead, phytostabilization immobilizes these contaminants. And as we are designing phytoremediation systems in order to be as successful as possible, we need to employ proper tree selection. And I'm going to show you a few pictures of one of our recent greenhouse studies to give you a visual of just how important proper tree selection is, give you a visual of how different tree varieties can perform differently in soils that are contaminated with contaminants that affect their growth. So in the back, we have our potting mix control. On the left, we have soils from an urban brownfield. And on the right, we have stamp sands, which are the contaminated byproduct of mining within, the, within Michigan's Upper Peninsula. So over time, we'll watch how these trees perform. At seven days after planting, 14 days, 21 days, 28 days, and 35 days. So here <clears throat> we can really see a difference in growth um, just comparing our stamp sands treatment to our urban brownfield treatment. We also can see that some of our varieties or otherwise you can call them clones or genotypes, some are performing better as far as biomass is concerned. They're much larger. And if we were to look at the physiological level of these, we might also notice some differences. Maybe some trees are greener than others, which might be an indicator of chlorophyll content, which could then impact photosynthesis and then the overall production of trees. So it's important to identify which varieties are performing the best under our site-specific conditions so that we can then implement them in the field and hopefully produce the greatest success for our phytoremediation system. So since tree selection, tree variety selection is so important, researchers at the USDA Forest Service, including Ron Selesny, developed phytorecurrent selection, which is a stepwise selection process involving multiple selection cycles to identify and select clones with superior performance. So basically, there are greenhouse testing cycles followed by field implementation and testing. And in this selection process, we would start out with many varieties of our trees or species that we are interested in. We would grow them in soils from our site of interest, the contaminated soils, and then harvest them after a determined amount of time and measure things like biomass production, so height, diameter, in order to quantify which ones are performing the best and then narrow down our pool of candidates in this example to 60 varieties. <clears throat> Again, we would plant them in the contaminated soils in the greenhouse, grow them for a certain amount of time, and then take measurements to evaluate which ones are actually performing the best. Narrow it down, do the same process until finally we are left with our best of the best that we can establish in the field and hopefully have the most successful phytoremediation system because we went through this process. And to give you a visual, here's our second one of over 100 different varieties. Cycle two, narrowed down. Cycle three, narrowed down again, choosing the best of the best based on biomass and physiological parameters. And then finally implementing in the field at contaminated sites. 
long-term monitoring of fighter remediation sites is also critical. So we've selected our trees, we've established them, but we can't just walk away after that. It's important to keep monitoring them because otherwise we don't know if the system is actually doing what we want it to be doing. Is it actually remediating the pollutants that we're interested in? Is it, are the trees performing well or can they not handle the type of contamination that is at this site? What's happening over the long term? Are there differences among varieties in performance, among varieties in survival? We need to know this information. We need to conduct long-term monitoring. And <clears throat> some examples of that that we are conducting currently at our fire remediation sites, we perform annual height and diameter measurements, which can help us evaluate the productivity, the biomass productivity of these trees, evaluate differences among tree varieties to see which ones are doing very well and which ones aren't because biomass productivity is one um, measure of how productive a fighter remediation site potentially is. We are also conducting water use studies of our cones at some of our sites. So here we have a sap flow probe, which is measuring the sap flow through the trees. And we can use that to quantify the water use of the trees, which is important because if there are contaminants in leachate or in the groundwater from the landfill, we want to know how much water the trees are taking up because that tells us potentially how much contaminants the trees are taking up. And then uh, a new approach to hopefully help increase the efficacy of phytoremediation systems that I'm involved in personally is a prioritization tool. So um, <clears throat> the flow of this tool is that we start out with landfill leachate or contaminated groundwater at a landfill. And we do not know what's in it, what contaminants exactly are in the leachate and which ones should we be targeting with our fighter remediation system. And traditionally, it would take a lot of time and it would be very um, inefficient and not cost effective to identify the pollutants that are within the landfill leachate, as well as to quantify them and to determine which ones to target. And we would base this off of anecdotal evidence or regulatory lists that may or may not be updated. But with this standardized prioritization tool, we take toxicity data from freely available toxicity databases, as well as integrate that with community priorities for the site in order to prioritize the contaminants that exist at the site. Which ones are the most potentially toxic that the community is the most concerned with, such as contaminants that cause cancer or that cause endocrine disruption. And once we can identify these, then we can design our fighter remediation systems to target those prioritized contaminants. And all of our work is made possible by partnerships and collaborations that we have. And here's an image of some of us, as well as some of our partners and collaborators at one of our fighter remediation buffer sites. So our trees are in the middle and in the background, you can see an active landfill where these trees are planted. And this is located in or near Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And through these collaborations and partnerships, we have created Great Lakes Vital, which is a consortium of researchers, engineers, site managers, practitioners, et cetera, who all have a vested interest in fighter remediation. They're all interested in utilizing plants to clean up these contaminated landfills and other soils and waters. Um, typically, uh, as Ron and I are employees of the USDA Forest Service within research and development, our modes of technology transfer have centered around interaction in the scientific community. Um, so that includes research manuscripts, conference presentations, and field tours. <clears throat> and we can also provide technical expertise to help inform decisions. And um, typically our partnerships are with organizations and institutions that work directly in the communities. 
though that's not always us working directly in the communities. But there is room for us to broaden our community, our direct community connection. Like for example, with the prioritization tool, working with communities to identify what their priorities are for contaminated sites so that we can identify how we can best meet their needs with our fighter remediation systems. We also are interested in educating the next generation because as I said, um, our actions today can greatly impact the future and hopefully by educating them and getting them uh, hands-on experiences with these problems, this can have a ripple effect and we can start tackling these issues of waste production and management in order to have transformative change. And in the past, we've had an environmental scholars program as well as a tribal scholars program that involves local high school students in hands-on natural resources experiences and get them exposed to this type of science, this type of work and see what folks are doing to tackle issues in natural resources. <clears throat> We've also held green science workshops to educate students and community members about fire remediation, as well as conducted green science, citizen science in the greenhouse, which um, allows citizens the opportunity to collect data as a scientist would, and that data is actually used to then make conclusions. And now I would like to turn over the floor to Ron, who is going to be describing some FIDO remediation case studies, real world applications of FIDO, and discussing in more detail the partnerships and the collaborations that we have with these studies. You got a lot of clothes. You certainly do. Do you have anything that you want washed? What are you doing, white or colored? Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks Liz, that was awesome. That was a really good job. Um, and uh, so as Liz said, and Liza said, my name is Ron Zlesny and I am a scientist with the USDA Forest Service Northern Research Station. And just like Liz did, I wanna kind of give you a little bit of background on myself, just so you kind of know where I came from so you can kind of understand where I'm at with respect to waste management, phytoremediation, and um, just uh, just being a scientist. And so um, early on in life, I realized that I was kind of a numbers guy and a, and a math geek. And then in addition to that, I was fortunate enough to get a job as a summer student with the Forest Service the day after I graduated from high school. And so you incorporate the math and the numbers with the trees. And then you, and then I always had this passion for biology and genetics. And I was very fortunate enough to be sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service to go to grad school. And that has kind of led to my interests in environmental applications or um, phytotechnologies like what Liz was talking about. And then what's really cool is when you add partnerships and collaborations to the mix, in addition to the ability to work throughout the world, then you have a very happy Ron and I'm so grateful to the US Forest Service for providing me a career where I can work with so many different wonderful people on so many different um, important environmental applications. And so that's where, that's where I'm at right now. I'm just really jacked and really pumped about FIDO. And so we've mentioned the Northern Research Station for those of you from around the world and also um, in the United States that aren't familiar with it, it's, it's this 22 state region and we have a bunch of different locations right now. Our headquarters is in Madison, Wisconsin. And Liz and I are coming from Rhinelander. You can see it there in Northern Wisconsin. And just as a reference point there, Chicago, for those of you who are from, from uh, um, or aren't, might not be familiar with, with the US very much. 
And in Rhinelander, dating back to the 1970s, our facility has a rich history of developing what are called short rotation woody crops. So these are poplars and willows in the Midwestern United States. Elsewhere in the world, these might be eucalyptus species or pine species. And so for my personal journey, I started in 1995 and then in 1999, um, started grad school, became a research forester. And then in 2003, came back as a, as a um, research geneticist. And what's really interesting is this has, is kind of somewhat the history of the phytotechnologies program within the Northern Research Station. So I mentioned before, from the 70s and then up till 1995, the short rotation woody crops program focused on feedstock production for energy and fiber. So traditional wood products and um, paper, pulp for paper, and those kinds of things. Then um, it, from 95 to 2003, and I'll show an example of our first phyto project ever, we got thinking, hey, what if we start using the genotypes that we have for these traditional applications for phytoremediation and other phytotechnologies? And so this was kind of our transitionary period. Then in 2003, when I came back, I said, okay, we need to kind of flip-flop things because of volatility in the biofuels markets and uh, other imports from, uh, of biomass from international sources and those kinds of things. Let's switch from focusing on traditional products to focusing on environmental applications. And so from 2003 till now, that's what we've done. And um, these are just some examples of our phytotechnologies projects. Um, if I'm not gonna go through bullet by bullet, but there's a website listed here. And if you go there, um, there are very short summaries on each one of these particular studies and projects. And so if you're interested, it's, it's a good way to kind of see the breadth and depth of what we're working on. But I will point out, Liz already talked about phytorecurrent selection. And then you can see a, um, a broad range of applications from salinity to biochar to mine reclamation and so on and so forth. Today, I'm going to, I have one slide on Fresh Kills Landfill in New York City. It's a really interesting example of, of uh, what is being done in the United States with respect to landfills. And then interspersed throughout my slides, I'll talk about phytoremediation of inorganic and organic contaminants. And then the real key here is that I'm going I'm to spend the majority of my time on, on our agroforestry phytoremediation buffer systems in the Great Lakes Basin. So this is the largest phytotechnologies testing network in the world. We have 16 replicated field sites in Michigan and Wisconsin, and I'll talk about it later, but um, this just sets the stage for what I'm going to, to, to be talking about. So you can see in this picture here, here are some of our poplar trees with the landfill in the background. This is an active landfill, so they're just um, adding waste and then putting these, uh, you can kind of see the beginning of the liner here. Um, so before I get talking about those applications, I want to stress what Liz talked about with the next generation and also international collaboration. So most recently, um, Dr. Andre Polipovich from the University of Nova Sad and I have been engaged in a long-term scientific exchange. He spent 20 months here in Rhinelander working on phytotechnologies research. And then we're so um, lucky within the US Forest Service to have the International Programs Program. And within that, the International Forestry Fellowship Program, which allows folks like myself to host international students to work on various aspects of their management and or research needs. And so um, since uh, 2017, we have been able to host three, David, Carlson from Sweden, Alexander Pekini from um, Albania, and then also uh, Pedro from Spain. And so you can see them pictured here. So this is a really good way, not only to educate the next generation, but to um, kind of spark or form collaborations that could last um, well into the future. And, what, what, and just a very personal note, what's really cool about this too is um, just learning, learning about the different cultures and, um, and all of the, the social things that go along with it to the point where 
my son and his wife actually a few years, two years ago now, spent uh, New Year's with Pedro and his significant other in Madrid. So like uh, these connections, I think are really powerful and deep and, and they can be lifelong connections. Um, in addition, mentoring students is extremely important to me. And this list here is just what we have been, uh, the, only the, is, are the students that we have mentored through the agroforestry fighter remediation buffer system project. So since 2016, we have mentored those undergrads and then grad students. The three that are listed in blue are current grad students, Ryan Vinhall, Brent DeBouche, and obviously now you know Liz. Um, and then lastly, Liz talked about this, so I won't go into any great detail, but it's a very huge passion of mine to mentor these younger students um, as early as middle school and high school. So the Northwoods Environmental Scholars Program and the Tribal Youth Internship Program are, are very important to me. So let's dive into, um, let's dive into some applications at landfills and talk about partnerships and talk about community implications. And so the, the bottom line is we're attempting to put trees where trees and other plants typically don't grow, right? And uh, so I'd like this image from that perspective. And so I talked about our first phytoremediation project ever, and it was at our Oneida County landfill. You can see the, the white star there on the state of Wisconsin. That, that's, that's where we're located. Uh, our, and that's where Oneida County is located. It's located in Rhinelander, sorry about that. And it actually started out as a real practical um, solution to an issue that our solid waste director had. So Oneida County, we're very rural. Rhinelander has about 8,000 residents and it's the biggest city within our county. But one thing that we do have is a lot of water and a lot of vegetation. We have 1,100 lakes and streams in our county. So any kind of potential pollution is very important to us. It's a huge recreation area and also um, uh, also with its connection to the Great Lakes, very important from a freshwater uh, provision perspective. And so our land, our solid waste director wanted to see if we could use landfill leachate as irrigation and fertilization for the trees as a means to not have to ship it off site to a wastewater treatment plant and have to pay millions of dollars a year for that treatment. And so that was the application. For us, it was awesome because we were like, well, yeah, okay, trees, we need, we often irrigate trees. Leachate contains macro and micronutrients that the trees need for growth. And we can get our foot in the door in terms of phytoremediation and the potential contaminants that are in that leachate. And so um, our first study, we grew the trees out, did some whole tree harvests and looked at um, root morphologies and physiological um, systems that were controlling uptake of the contaminants. And so that, that's, that was, like I said, kind of day, that was day one, our start, our foundation. This is not our study. This is the only one that, I, the only slide I'm going to have that we did not, um, that we did not initiate. But this is a really cool, probably one of the most well-known wastewater treatment examples in the world. This is from a collaborator named Janis Dimitriou from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Uppsala, Sweden. And they had also a very practical application, but has had uh, many presentations and publications and, and um, recommendations based on this study. And so they had this wastewater treatment plant. They put in these storage ponds and you can see um, back here, these short rotation woody crop plantations. And so kind of the same thing that we did in Rhinelander, but at a much larger scale, irrigated them. You can see the statistics down there, um, uh, treating essentially 20,000 cubic meters of nitrogen rich water, which is, which is phenomenal. And then for them, also getting the willow biomass crops as bioenergy feedstocks. So that was kind of the community connection um, with respect to the economics. In addition, early on, uh, earlier on in my career, I was fortunate to be involved with U.S. Forest Service International Programs and USAID on an, an Egyptian wastewater recycling project. And so um, the Nile River 
And, and, and if my information on this slide is incorrect, if, if there are any Egyptians on the call or other folks that know this inf current information, this is from 2009 and I apologize, I didn't have time to check to see if this is still relevant. So act like we're in 2009 and I'm, and I'm giving this presentation. So um, the Nile River provides 97% of Egypt's fresh water, but 80% of that is used for agriculture. And the issue is that Egypt's share of that Nile water is allocated according to international treaty obligations with the Sudan. And so that volume is fixed at 55 and a half billion cubic meters annually. And given increasing population growth and the need for that fresh water for agricultural purposes and also just for human purposes in the bigger, especially in the bigger cities, it is cha very challenging for Egypt to meet those demands. And so Early uh, in the in the early 2000s, they began investigating whether um, wastewaters, such as sewage water, could be used as alternatives for certain types of agriculture. And what they landed on was that it could be used for tree crops and other crops that are non-edible crops, but that they could actually get uh, a return from. And so, um, the technical assistance team that I was involved with. Um, was assessing the potential for afforestation in Egypt using um, secondary treated wastewater for various tree crops. And has this, this had very huge implications for local communities because um, you know, wood is, is such a, a commodity there, not necessarily for exporting and stuff, but just for fires and home use and those kinds of things. And so, um, so we worked on that and we made our recommendations. You can see we have a couple publications there. If anyone's interested in this, we can chat later, but I just wanted to give another international example of wastewater uh, recycling. Um, so I mentioned that the um, I mentioned that the secondary treated wastewater can be used for tree crops and other non-edible crops, but globally there are potential issues with using landfill leachate or other wastewaters to produce crops that are then eaten. This is called urban foraging, right? And so we were involved with an urban foraging and environmental justice project in Chicago, partnering with the American Indian Center of Chicago, um, looking at um, potential contamination from various species that were being foraged from the Dunning Reed Conservation Area. And so our objective was to collect the plants that were used in urban foraging, then collect the soils, test the metal levels in the plants and soils, correlate those together, and then assess whether the metal levels exceeded the values that were safe for human consumption. Now this depends, right, on, this depends on frequency of eating and then also the duration. So if someone's eating it every day for, you know, 20 years of their life, there's a much bigger impact than, oh, three times a year I have something and I've had it, oh, every other year or something like that. So the, it, the analyses of whether it's safe for human consumption are very difficult to do. And so, um, but, but this was the, the objective. And so with our expertise with phytoremediation we were involved. You can see some milkweed there. Um, the flowers and the leaves are eaten and then also some mulberry on the bottom picture. And just to give an example of what we were doing for the community where was producing these maps of concentrations of what was in the soil and what we found in the tissues to kind of say, oh, are there hot spots? Should they not be eating from those areas? And so on and so forth. So um, just wanted to piggyback that on the Egyptian thing because this is a real this is a real concern in many areas, many urban and rural areas as well. Our second phytoremediation study was at our Rhinelander City landfill, and it was the objective here was to also irrigate and fertilize and and fertigate or irrigate and fertilize the trees with landfill leachate. But this one, I don't have it pictured here, but this one had a, a different spin to the application where on the left side of this photo is a small creek that then drains into a bigger river that then drains into the Wisconsin River and then ultimately the Mississippi River. And so this one had a water connection because 
um, we were attempting to stop the runoff and, um, and use these trees as a green liver or a buffer so that it didn't get to the creek. And so this was um, just our, our kind of, I just wanted to show you the second one that we also had in Rhinelander. So I mentioned before Fresh Kills Park. This is a really, or Fresh Kills Landfill, I should say. This is a really interesting situation on Staten Island in New York. Um, you can see the blue star there. This is, uh, Staten Island is one of the boroughs in uh, New York City. And this landfill at its peak was 2,200 acres. It was the largest landfill in the world. Um, and you can see in the, um, Oh, shoot, I'm sorry, uh, that this map shouldn't be there right now. But you can see um, in the background here, New York City when looking at looking towards the city from the landfill. So um, and then down below where they're installing one of the one of the cells and one of the caps. And so a colleague named Rich Hallett, who is a scientist in the Northern Research Station and I began in about 2010 working with the C uh, Department of Parks and Recreation in the city of New York to see if we can install some phytoremediation trials on the landfill. Because here's the kicker, the city of New York is converting the landfill to a usable park within the next 20 to 30 years. And so they have already done a lot in terms of making um, interpretive trails and other areas that people are starting to use. If you're interested, you can go to this website, freshkillspark.org and look at it. And so as part of that landfill to park conversion, there were areas that had potential contamination that we were going to work at. It then transitioned from a phyto project to an urban afforestation project where we were, we were testing various pallets of tree species against what the parks department typically does to see if our workhorse species, our poplars and willows can be used to capture the site quickly and then ultimately underplant with shade tolerant species that are gonna be there for 60, 70 years or more. And so you can see some folks measuring some of Rich's trees. He um, in total planted a little over 10,000 trees at the landfill. And so now um, we're conducting long-term monitoring of that. And this is a um, paper that we put on there for propagating the native uh, poplars and willows for these um, restoration efforts. So Liz mentioned Great Lakes Fido and I also just want to say how grateful I am for all of the collaborators that she showed on her slide because this, all of these efforts are not conducted just by my team or just by the Forest Service. It takes everyone. And we, it, we have very strong community partnerships in addition to education partnerships, as you've seen. But then from a research and management perspective. We work with um, industry like waste management, which is one of the largest um, waste management companies in the world, in addition to cities and counties, and then in Wisconsin and Minnesota um, on the projects that I'm gonna show you, the regulators, right? Because those are the folks that are um, ensuring that whatever, in whatever potential impacts there are to the environment are safe for their, um, for their citizens. And so um, with Great Lakes Fido, this is just a, a little bit of a, um, this is just a figure that kind of shows, shows you what we're always thinking about. So the problem, degraded lands and waters. And our solution are our agroforestry phyto buffer systems. We focus on the three pillars of sustainability quality of life, stewardship, and profit. And so when we're looking at stewardship, this is the direct connection to phytoremediation, clean water, healthy soils, carbon sequestration, and the whole slew of potential ecosystem services. In addition, from a profit perspective, these are things that we use biomass feedstock for, so bioenergy, biofuels, bioproducts, and then also just gaining enhanced productivity of the land. 
So this is an example of an air photo of um, one of our agroforestry phyto buffer systems. I'll just call them phyto buffers from here on out. The map shows the 16 um, locations that I was talking about before. We planted six of them in 2017, five in 2018, and five in 2019. And from a poplar perspective, we have cycle four from our phytorecurrent selection at the sites. So these are our clone trials, in addition to yield trials, so that eventually we will conduct whole tree biomass harvests and actually look at what is the productivity of those trees and how does that productivity compare to biomass productivity of trees that are grown on non-contaminated lands, because obviously that feeds into the economics of the entire situation. And then demonstration plots, which are when we give field tours and, and um, uh, green science workshops and those kinds of things. From a willow perspective, we have um, also have cycle four trees. And then Ryan Vinhall, the um, uh, student that you saw on the sl previous slide, and Brent Debouche, who also was on that slide, um, developed a, a unique system called the Devalix technique which are willow mats for restoration. I'm not gonna talk about that today because I kind of want to focus more on um, the leachate aspects and the, and the uh, other phytoremediation aspects. But if you're interested in, in alternative methods of establishing willow for phytoremediation, please reach out to me. And just like Liz said before, I, I want to acknowledge the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Without the GLRI, we would not, uh, none of this work would have been possible. And so very quickly, um, I'm just going to run through three quick kind of data slides, but not really deep dive into the data because I'd rather get into the, the applications for you. Um, so we have, we, we, we first conducted greenhouse trials. This is one of Liz's um, projects where we looked at physiological parameters related to morphology and um, growth. And then this last winter, we, we put out our first um, peer-reviewed publications from our field data. And so this first one talks about what we call genotype by environment interaction. So how do certain clones grow in areas and being able to select which ones grow best based on the contamin based on the soil conditions, the particular contaminants, and where those trees put those contaminants into their tissues. We then took that one step further and were able to partner with the University of Minnesota Duluth Natural Resources Research Institute to look at some um, new clones that are showing exceptional promise. And this is really important for us because our previous um, varieties are old and we have not had any new clones in, in our region for decades and, uh, and have found increases in biomass productivity up to 50% with some of these new clones. And we're just in the beginning stages of testing the actual phytoremediation effectiveness. Liz touched on the long-term monitoring and uh, also her prioritization tool. And so now I'll just run through some, some of the actual applications. So in Bellevue, Wisconsin, this is one of the landfill sites. We have runoff reduction and phytoremediation where um, the overland flow is going with, with these uh, white arrows from left to right. And you can see in the upper right, this water. And so we're trying to stop the runoff from getting there, but in this, at the same time, the trees are acting as a filter and remediating the contaminants. This is just a, that same site showing how fast the trees grow. This is in June of 2018, July of 2018, and then July of 2019. And this is um, just kind of another view of a companion site at that particular landfill. This is a different landfill where the application is groundwater recycling. And so the, um, the groundwater um, flows in the direction of these yellow arrows. And there is a um, 30 foot deep clay wall right here alongside the road that catches that groundwater. And it gets sent over to um, a collection basin that's over by this building. And then they haul it away and treated at a, a wastewater treatment plant. So this is similar to that Oneida County landfill study where we are irrigating the trees with that contaminated groundwater. The organic contaminants volatilize in the air and the irrigation water is then used by the trees and it's saving a lot of money from hauling away. And then also the added benefits of not having things like, you know, the 
fuel that's consumed by the haul trucks and so on and so forth. This is just another image of that. And you can see we have both poplars and willows. You can see a difference in um, crown architecture and density. The willows are much more dense. They're planted closer together. Poplars are wider spacing. Um, this is uh, another site in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, where we have contaminated groundwater that is flowing through this wetland, uh, this constructed wetland treatment pond and under the trees. And so we're trying to capture that. And so if we kind of kept going in this, in this direction to the bottom left, about two, um, about four kilometers away is Lake Michigan. And so we're trying to capture this, capture this at the source. So this is true phytoremediation, phytostabilization, and phytovolatilization. Here too, you can, it's just another good picture of it. And then you can see these clonal differences in crown architecture. So I'll just point out these look much different than the other ones. And that's on purpose because we're trying to figure out which ones are best for this application. At this particular landfill in Menominee Falls, this is just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We have poplars, willows, and another set of poplars in the background. And we're capturing storm with this, the poplars in the background, we're capturing storm water off of this parking lot. Um, where they have their waste trucks. And so there's often um, fuel and oil and other things that drain in uh, oops, that drain in this direction and impact a wetland behind these trees and then also the water that you see here. And then runoff reduction from runoff that's going into the water. And then of course, another application here is phytoremediation. Here's another view of those poplars, the willows, and then the other poplars. This is an actual constructed wetland that captures that runoff before it gets to our trees. And then uh, I just wanted to give you a, a, a view from the ground um, to see our trees and then the water and then um, an active landfill in the background. And the last application I'll show you is in Caledonia, Wisconsin. This is south of Milwaukee. And this, I like this picture because it really shows the, land, the landscape matrix, right? And so you, can, you have the landfill here, Here's one set, one planting of our, one phyto buffer that we have. And you can see how close sometimes the, the people's houses are to the landfills and then agricultural fields in the background. And this is just another view. And this is a companion planting. Also, I would like to point out the water here. So this is another one where runoff is important and, but phytoremediation, phytostabilization and phytovolatilization are really key. And then I just wanted to show you another image of the willows and poplars from above. And so going back to the, um, this, the concept of Great Lakes Fido and our problem solution and outcome, and just say that through all of these examples that I've shown you today, it really is about the integration of the stewardship, the quality of life and the profit for communities and for citizens and stakeholders. We as the USDA Forest Service Northern Research Station are fortunate enough to be able to partner with other academicians, regulators, industry, local communities to be able to try and make a difference, provide those ecosystem services as well as profits while allowing um, communities to maintain their livelihoods and quality of life. And so with that, I thank you and uh, um, we look forward to the panel discussion, and um, and if you have any questions, you can email Liz or myself, and we we love talking about Fido. And thank you, Liza, for the ability to speak today. Thanks, Ron, and uh, and Liz, thank you so much. Um, before we continue with our panelists, I wanted to ask folks if they have any questions we can entertain, maybe two or three questions now just about the science behind it and then we can go into the community the people environmental justice etc after our panelists introduce themselves are there any questions uh, please feel free to write them in the chat or um, just turn on your mics and your cameras and let us know um, you know if this is if you have any questions okay. So Ron and Liz, just a quick question on my part. When 
people grow things on top of landfills, are they, what do they cap it with? What's the science behind that? Oh, you're muted, Ron. Sorry. The landfill caps for, for today's standards are very complex and they usually involve multiple layers of gravel and clay and sometimes geomembranes that are really thick. And so it's just kind of like a lasagna, right? And there it's mm -hmm. like, you've got the waste in here and then all these different layers. So from a phytoremediation perspective, and I apologize that I didn't mention it, if the landfill is capped, typically we cannot plant on top of that because they don't want any penetrations into that, into those engineered layers, because mm -hmm. then you would get infiltration from precipitation and those kinds of things. So um, what we do is we plant just outside the limits of historic waste. And so mm -hmm. they have everything mapped out and they know like right here is where the waste ended. And so we put our trees just on the other side of that. That's why in those photos, you can always see like the cap or the, the landfill itself. And then our trees are always kind of off to the side. That's why. And typically we try and put the trees outside the limits of historic waste, but in between that and some kind of water body, right? Because for the water is the, is the key issue. Um, and what's cool is we're trying to get a seat at the table with, when new land, not necessarily new land, well, yeah, that would be awesome if it was a new landfill, but typically like a new cell within a landfill is being designed and developed so that we can try and have our trees be an actual strategic part of those new cells, right? So that it's not that we only have 200 meters on the outside of that limits of the historic waste in between the water, right? We mm -hmm. actually have like bonafide portions where we can have these, these phyto buffers. And so we, we're not there yet, but we're mm -hmm. moving in that direction and having those kinds of conversations. Perfect, thank you. Um, Florencia, hello. Um, she's asking, which are the varieties of trees uh, that should be used for phyto remediation? Yeah, so the, um, the two genera that are the most are the the, the the two genera that are the most used and most effective worldwide are populist salix. So these are poplars and willows. Right. And like Liz said, within those two, there are well worldwide there are thousands of different varieties. And so it it like wherever you are, there probably are some type of poplar and willow. And then those can be selected for these applications. Like I said before, other fast growing trees like eucalypts and pines in some region are also effective. Um, we focus on poplars just because we're from a temperate zone, so. Perfect. Um, so I'm gonna ask Mark's question and then we'll entertain Naomi's question and then move on for now. Um, from Mark Ambrose of the Forest Service, overall, how good is phytoremediation? How does it compare with other alternatives for treatment? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about with respect to other alternatives, if, if you mean like green alternatives or just kind of traditional applications, but phytoremediation is the most effective green solution for environmental cleanup. Um, it's extremely cost effective. It costs about a third to a quarter, sometimes half of the cost of traditional engineering methods. Um, the drawback is the time scale. So sometimes it can take 10, 20 years before you, um, we actually can get the soil um, remediated to the point where it, it allows the regulators to say, yeah, you're below whatever that regu regulatory threshold is. Now, um, for those of you who don't know, traditional applications would be something like excavating soil, hauling it somewhere, incinerating that soil, and then having to bring other soil in to replace the soil they brought out. And we had an example of this in the state of Illinois with a project where they literally in the middle of a city on a three mile radius circle had to excavate everyone's front yards and everything, haul out the soil, bring in other soil. I mean, it was a massive, I mean, we're talking tens and tens of millions of, of US dollars for it and then just all of the other impacts ecologically and stuff. In that situation, we had our trees at the source site and the trees were remediating it, but the problem is that the dumping was going on for so long that, mm -hmm. you know, it, 
in, in that situation, really the engineering approach was the only option. But um, I, I hope that answers your question, Mark. If you have follow-up questions, just email, let me know. Thanks, Ron. Um, Naomi, please. Um, yes, hi. Um, my question pertains to the use of biochar. Now, there's extensive research on biochar, which traditionally was always an agricultural soil amendment, not tree-specific amendment. And so mm -hmm. the research has shown that both that that the energy consumed during production and delivery of biochar is not sustainable. And in addition, in urban areas, the forest trees that we are traditionally planting within our urban centers are usually acid to slightly to neutral. And biochar is traditionally a a high pH additive. And so why not use organic compost as the soil additive? Why use such something that is so energy intensive in production? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it, it depends on the location and availability of feedstock oftentimes. So in the, in the Western United States, for example, where we have um, so much bark, uh, beetle killed, a uh, bark beetle killed trees. And we have an unlimited supply of dead trees that are on the ground. Oftentimes what they'll do is they'll have mobile biochar units and they'll go out and they'll make the char and then they will apply it to the forest stands. And so in that particular situation, it's, it's small scale. And I, I know what you're saying with energy return, energy invest, energy uh, return up from energy invested kind of thing. Um, but I think like it has so many advantages from the standpoint of increasing the productivity of the forests that they can outweigh the energy, the, the energy um, issues. You bring up a really good point with the biosolids. That's something that I didn't talk about today, but that is definitely a major um, arena for potential um, biomass productivity increases because, I mean, obviously the, the, the nutrient benefits and the orga adding organic and something organic to the soil is important. Um, on our mine reclamation trials, biochar is important because we just need to get some kind of agronomic property to the soil. And uh, another Another positive aspect of biochar is that um, we have been testing it to substitute for vermiculite and or perlite in greenhouse and nursery potting mixes. And so we found that we can get good cation exchange capacity in other agronomic soil properties for tree production. Um, so that's, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you have any follow-up. We can, we can well, chat later. But what too. about the pH issue? pH of biochar is traditionally be way beyond seven. And most of the trees that we are working with are in fact five, six, maximum seven. And so one should not be introducing alkaline pH material into soil that is going to support trees that want a more acid pH. I, I think I can't, I can't really speak to that because I think that would be application specific, right? If there was a parks and rec department or something like that, and they were doing that, certainly that would not be a prudent silvicultural prescription. But there are, the flip side of that is, there are many applications, say on the um, saline soils in the southwestern U.S. or the sodic soils in North Dakota in the United States where, um, where that might not be the case or where, um, I'm trying to think of a, a, an example that we've had recently. We have high, I mean, I'm sorry, extremely low pH soils in the iron range of Minnesota. They're, the soils are sometimes down into the three pH. And so in that particular situation, biochar would be great because you can increase the pH, the pH so that it can actually sustain the tree growth. So I think you, you have a very valid point. 
I think that it just depends on where you are, what the particular application is. Certainly biochar shouldn't be used everywhere, but I think that it does have, could have positive benefits if it's matched to what the soil conditions are and what the objectives are for the tree, um, for the tree planting and restoration. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi, and thanks, Ron, for that. And with that, why don't we turn to our panelists for today, and each one will just give a, a summary of what he or she is doing with respect to waste management and urban forestry and community engagement. And I want to start with my good friend, Agustina Iskandar from Jakarta, Indonesia. And Agustina, take it away, please. Thank you, Liz. I am so happy, as always, come back to US um, Forestry Network and meet, meet a lot of uh, people, which is always inspiring. Every time that I join the webinar and listen to everyone, like, uh, you know, like it's give a lot of energy, like, oh my God, I want to do this. Oh my God, I want to do that. Like, you know, feel not always enough what uh, I am doing right now, but it's really good to know that more people doing, uh, at least we do something. Of course, uh, of course, like, you know, for me, for example, like I cannot do so much, I cannot do many things, but at least I can do something. And seeing so many people also do their things, that is a happiness. So yeah, today, you can see maybe my face a little bit like sleepy and also like quite tired, but it's not because uh, uh, it's already late in Indonesia, basically not so late, but yeah. But today I was so tired because I, I, I was going to, to the beach and see quite a few locations uh, in Jakarta area where basically I was checking for trash. So, um, and uh, in, in, in uh, I was going there for like, you know, in, in the beach locations and also in the in the lake in, in, in Jakarta itself, particularly. So I was checking like, um, what is the situation with waste right now? Because, you know, uh, uh, we, during work in our day where all of us normally that going out from the, from any, any locations and we just clean, clean up, you know, the city, the beach, the mountain, the forest, and, and, and all of these locations. But during uh, um, lockdown in Jakarta itself, for example, we don't go out. Uh, so we don't, we cannot gather. This, this is what uh, I'm try, trying to say. So we cannot really gather to, to do clean up. But uh, we are planning, however, to do like, you know, small clean up in, in, in quite a few areas where we are trying to, to, to clean quite a few locations. And in Jakarta, uh, like in this uh, this week, that where we we will try as well, working with our partner Ocean Kita, trying to 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 use straw net to clean the the, the waste in our uh, uh, um, um, uh, ocean, but 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 particularly in, ja in Jakarta area, like we clean in the uh, close to the beach and also in the lake um, in in Jakarta Lake, uh, which is the north. And, and there are so many trash as well there. So using kayak and then we will clean together with um, uh, with with the volunteers. And it's, it's really good that today we also like meeting, uh, for example, the, the army in Jakarta, which will help us as well to, to, to take trash together. So this is, uh, this is about the activity today, but uh, maybe some of you that know already that working up there is one of the, the, the biggest clean up, clean up actions in the world. And uh, for, uh, for Indonesia, it's, it's really needed to do clean up. I also like, you know, uh, I mean, uh, uh, often people like questions like, why, why we, we, we do clean up? Like, you know, why you, we still need clean up? But for uh, Indonesia itself is still needed. And I will start with a story, for example, um, uh, with Louis Gajah story in, in Bandung one of the city in Indonesia as well in West Java. So in 2005, that there are, we lost like 157 people uh, at that time in, in, in landfill when, when um, landslide happening and bury all, all of our scavengers and uh, the people who live in, in two village in that area. It was really sad, this kind of thing happening that uh, we should prevent it from the first place. So this kind of thing like shouldn't happen. And then um, 
we we now like every February, every every year that that we um, remember these people uh, from 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 landfill. Well, we also do something with our waste uh, every year. And uh, in 2015, uh, when Indonesia was mentioning everywhere as the second uh, uh, country uh, that uh, pollute uh, the the ocean. Um, I mean, with plastic waste after, uh, waste after China, it's also really break our heart, for example, like, you know, as a young people, like watching your country was mentioning everywhere as the second uh, country who pollute the ocean. So, I mean, for me itself, like, it's, it's really, it's really how to say, like, hurt to see what are all of this. And, in, and, and then uh, in, two, in 2019, when the report show that our biggest landfill in Indonesia in Ban called Bantar Gebang, it's uh, where all the Jakarta waste end up, uh, it's almost full, like it's only for two years. That's mean in this year. So we produce, uh, if you see that now that they, for, from Lisa's slide that um, is 6,000 tons, but now it's already more than 7,000 tons waste a day that we produce in Jakarta and everything's end up in, 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 in um, in, in this uh, uh, Bandar Gebang landfill. So this is a, uh, for us, I mean, for, for me as a young people in Indonesia that and all the people there, we cannot see our country like this. Of course, we want to do something, but it's really big, big job, like, you know, to, to, to have the country to solve the problem. That's why that we start with the movement, like, you know, Working update is one of the vehicle we think that we can unite people to wake pe people up, like ho like to call every everyone uh, to realize that we have really serious problem. So we use this um, movement as um, um uh, how to say as a tools of communications to hold the hands of government, of the company, and the community to work together and to solve the waste problem from the source. So. 72% of uh, Indonesian people, they don't care about waste issue. This is the fact what we have. And 81% all the waste around Indonesia mix up and 77% end up in landfill. While our landfill right now are fools. So this is, this is really a huge problem for us. Well, the, the system itself, um, how to say it's not not so much for example like uh happening even like we are trying really really hard but the waste uh production is still increased like now it's already seven uh 67 million tons of waste every year that we produce in indonesia a few years ago still like 64 uh, million tons of waste and uh, and now it's it's, it's already seven uh, uh, the, uh, 67. So from this, for example, like from 81% that um, waste all of um, mix up and most of them end up in landfill, but also some of them end up in forest, in the, in the ocean and in the river and everywhere. So what we are doing basically with work clean up day, we try to educate the people through the actions. So even like, for example, uh, here, the problem of littering, <laughs> not even to mention it, but people still do it. it it's sad, but, but it's, it's, it still happen. And we try to educate people not only like to bring them to experience the clean up itself. So because, you know, we believe when the million of people come to the clean up, they will have a commitment with themselves like next, next day or tomorrow or, 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 or start from today, they will commit and they will, they will not uh, do littering anymore because today they clean up other people's ways why they have to, to, I mean, like, why they still do littering. And then the second thing is to talk about now that start from after three years, we are not only doing the, the, the clean up actions, but we educate people how to do waste segregation at home. So then we can minimize the, the, the waste not to end up in landfill. But even to that, that people don't know how to start, like why we have to separate the waste? Because it's, it's always easy like to just put everything and then to just give to the, the waste picker, for example. They, and then we have to really work from that. We prepare all the material, um, uh, education material, like 
we really do this, you know, like to have like all really, really like a lot of training to educate the people how to do waste segregation from why we have to do that and how to do who how to separate waste organic and unorganic and all of this and how what like in, in this simple way how what you can do at home and then after that in some uh when the people also that you know there are so many community that already changed that there are village like give the good example where they can already like um doing a, a clean up, uh, um, um, for example, regularly, and then they're also doing waste uh, segregation and they also should example at end because then they will, they manage their own waste. So this is really good um, uh, behavior changes, And the data show, for example, there are people like changes from before work clean up day and after work clean up day. So this is what make us believe that this is the time, the time that we can do something to half the country. We cannot just watch this country or watch the, the planet um, in this situations. And we, we, with the, with, we, for example, gather a lot of people, a uh, million of people that we believe that, that, that's, that we can change the country. So maybe this is for opening Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Agustina. I really appreciate that. And I think she's being very modest and we'll hear from her later about how she started off a, f a little over a decade ago with a few handful of people, literally, and now it's over a million people who volunteer for cleanup. And it's her passion and her drive and, it, you know, her leadership that's, that's done that. So thank you, Agustina. And let's um, turn it over to Jayan Seti from India, from We Mean to Clean. Um, their organization does both tree planting and cleanup, and they've been also involved in World Cleanup Day. Jayant, please. Thank you, Liu. So, hello, everyone. I am Jayant. Uh, by profession, I am a software engineer, but also a sustainability enthusiast. So, this interest and passion led me to join We Mean to Clean in the year 2017 uh, when I was in college. And since then, I have uh, learned a lot with being in the team and become an environmentally conscious citizen and have been involved in multiple projects with them as well. So to coming back to uh, what we mean to clean is and what we do. So we are a citizen led volunteer group comprising of like minded people from all walks of life. We have MNC professionals, doctors, lawyers, biodiversity experts, students and many other professionals. Uh, who have a not knack to do something productive for the society and for the environment. So We Mean to Clean started in 2014. And since its, its inception, we are focusing on three key issues, uh, which involves waste management, native tree plantation drives, and cleanliness drives. I will quickly dive into each of them and give a brief what we do uh, in these three sectors. So as a part of waste management initiatives, we deliver workshops in resident societies and schools and work with uh, these institutions to help them to become a zero waste in, uh, institution. And uh, apart from this, uh, we still have to make some significant break in this area, but yeah, we are trying to do something uh, good here. Apart from this, we also believe that uh, charity begins at home. So we initially started with this waste management initiative with our own volunteers. We give workshops to them to how to make compost at home, how to make bioenzymes, uh, the importance of segregation. And once our volunteers were well equipped with this knowledge, then we started to reach out to community members and started some, doing something major on, in this area. Coming to the second focus area, which is native tree plantation. So we have planted thousands of native tree saplings to date in Delhi NCR region, which is the capital of India. And so I stress on, uh, I would like to stress here on the word native here, because uh, trees can help in environment conservation, but native trees also help in biodiversity and ecological balance. So that's our motive to not only do something for the environment, but also for the biodiversity and ecological balance. Uh, and it's not only that we just plant saplings and forget. So whenever we plant any sapling, we regularly water them, uh, we maintain them. And as I told you, uh, we initially taught our uh, volunteers how to make a compost. So we use the, that compost to nourish our saplings that we have planted. And uh, 
coming to the third part to it, cleanliness drives. So uh, in this, what we do, we just pick up a uh, area which is a victim of littering or open defecation. We clean it and transform it into an aesthetic place that people respect and uh, also do some awareness drive with people around there with the community uh, so that uh, that the place remains uh, what we are leaving it uh, good and beautiful and does not become a victim of open defecation or littering again. Now coming to the waste situation in India. So if I talk about the waste generated in India that in around 200 to 600 grams per day waste is generated on an average in India. And this uh, a total of 62 million tons every year we can say. Now we have faced some serious consequences because of the improper management of waste. However, much has been done to tackle the same, which will be my focus point for the day. So to start with, uh, I would like to highlight a situation in my city itself in Delhi. So we have three major landfill sites here, which are overflowing their capacity already. Uh, however, now authorities have realized that the graveness of the issue and as a result, recently, the municipal bodies have pledged to make the city go zero garbage in the next six months. And they're also planning to make a significant reduction in the height of these landfill sites uh, with the use of their planning to use trommel machines. Uh, in fact, uh, with the use of trommel machines in Delhi, one of the landfill sites uh, reduced to 40 feet uh, in one year. It has processed around 1,30,000 uh, MD of waste. And uh, similarly, there are many other cities in the country which are already zero waste and uh, many other cities which are trying to implement the same model. Then coming to the community engagement. Uh, so in India, we have a solid waste management rule. Now there are some challenges uh, if I talk about the implementation. However, it says that every household needs to segregate its waste. Now, uh, with this, some of the cities have been pitching a new model where they will ins give incentives to uh, the people who segregate their waste and make compost. So the municipal bodies are trying to say people that you make compost and we will buy it from you and we will use that in the public parks. So it will also save uh, the, the cost of compost that uh, municipal bodies have to pay. Uh, because they will uh, buy it at some list price and people will get some incentive. So this will help to uh, engage the community and uh, drive a deep behavioral change, you can say. The other solution I would like to talk about is a, a technological driven. So for example, plastic, which is a, a menace for the whole world, but uh, like we have uh, figured out a way where we can use the plastic to make roads. So as you can also see in the slide, uh, we have made uh, 703 kilometer of national highways using waste plastic and it turned out to be a better alternative than the traditional roads that we have and then we have some other examples as well like in one of the landfill sites there was a dumping ground where we used some herbal methods uh, enzymes and bacteria to uh, deal with the waste menace there so these are some examples which i wanted to highlight that Situation is uh, not that good, but uh, there are solutions. And as a community, we can definitely resolve this challenge together. Thank you. Thank you, Jayant, and I really appreciate that. And uh, for those in the audience, um, We Mean to Clean is part of a network, the Delhi Urban Network, of um, seven organizations, along with the US Forest Service International Programs, to uh, address a lot of the conservation issues in Delhi, India. So thank you, Jan, for that. And I wanna turn this over to Camila from Lima, Peru with our partner there, FICUS. Camila, please. Look, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm glad to share um, mine and FICUS's experience with waste in Lima. Um, so I am Camila, I am a geographer. I have been working in FICUS for six years. And uh, what we do in FICUS, we are a small organization. We promote social and environmental development in the cities. We specifically work in Lima. Lima is Peru's capital. And um, well, we also aim to promote public policies, legislation um, to solve the problems that we handle, that we deal with in our projects. 
So um, to introduce my city, Lima, it's a city in the coast of Peru. It is the capital. We are 10 million people here, and that is about the 30% of the national population. So we are a very centralized country. Uh, in Lima, uh, Lima generates uh, over 7,000 tons of garbage per day, and only 88% of that garbage is being collected. Where is the rest going? Mostly to rivers, um, to the ocean, or to informal landfills all over the city. Um, also, Lima was, um, a few weeks ago, Lima was appointed as the, the city in Latin America with the worst air quality. So I believe that in my city and in my country in Peru, we do have a serious problem with dealing with our waste, our pollution, our byproducts. And I think this is a, a systemic problem that we have not been able to address well. Um, I, I also believe that uh, the problems related to waste management are very spatial, maybe because I am a geographer, but uh, I do believe it's all uh, in space. And in Lima, as I imagine in other cities of developing countries, um, usually the districts where with the higher income uh, and that have the, the higher consumption of, of material um, and to generate the most waste are the districts where our waste management system is working at 100%. And of course, there are other districts in, in the city, mostly uh, most recent districts in the peripheries and uh, with a lower income where uh, the waste management is at 0%. And um, the thing is that as, as Lisa, uh, as Agustina mentioned in their stories, uh, waste is risky. We all know that waste is risky and as it's a risk. So it implies vulnerability. So I wanted to, to bring to the discussion today uh, this issue of how uh, cities are usually transferring the, the waste and then the risk and therefore the vulnerability to other places in the city where, where usually uh, people that are already vulnerable um, have to receive this uh, and and usually the landfills in, in my city are located in, in these districts. Um, now in FICUS, we have tried to encourage waste management at the source um, of um, lower income districts. And um, we have been working with organic waste um, and compost production as, as uh, the picture that you can see there is one of uh, our days where we were working. We, we usually, um, well, we did some workshops with the community and um, teach them how to segregate because segregation is, uh, uh, even in, in, in all of the districts of the city, segregation is, is not common. So uh, we did some segregation um, workshops and uh, by the end of the week, we went there with a huge group of volunteers and gathered with the community members to compost. So. Um, I do think uh, these um, spaces that we create to, to deal with waste are places where community can talk, can learn, can, can share and, and expand these actions, which are important. And, and after that, uh, composting activities for all, over a year, we did some tree planting in the area. Lima is located in the desert. So we don't have much green areas here, and we also have a problem with water. So we have to work with a special tree species that don't consume much water, but trees don't grow, don't just grow because of rain here. And so um, um, I think that although our initiatives are, are very important and necessary, we do need to start thinking how to scale up our initiatives into um, municipalities or uh, the national government to integrate these initiatives into the city system. And I also want to, to share that, of course, uh, waste management and green, green areas, I think, are a perfect match in the cities. Uh, solid waste will turn into compost, uh, the organic waste will turn into compost. And also wastewater 
will be treated and used for irrigation, especially in a city like Lima, which has no, no water availability. And we just need to, to work in Lima towards uh, uh, working in a cycle instead of a linear use and then dispose um, our waste. Thank you, Camila, and I really appreciate that and what you're talking about in terms of water scarcity and whatever water you may have, you know, we don't want that groundwater to be polluted. Um, and as you say, uh, it's, I think you and Jayant and Agustina really talked about mobilizing the community and also bringing it up to the federal level. And the good thing is, before we go on to Cauter, is that Recently, uh, World Resources Institute, uh, United Nations Environment Program, World Bank, they created a new initi a global initiative called Urban Shift, which really brings to mind pollution, biodiversity loss, and climate change. And at the intersection of that is cities. And they recognize the importance of working with communities to address these problems. So it's no longer from their point of view, we're going to keep it up here at the top level, the ministerial level. Let, let's hear from our communities themselves. And so with that, I'm going to turn that, this over to Kauter from Tunisia. Kauter, please, you're welcome. Tell us about yourself and Kirawan. Let's see, Kauter, I think you might be muted. You're, you're muted. You're still muted. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so glad to join you in this webinar. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to, to introduce you introduce myself. I'm Kathy Fatnati from the APNEC, uh, the Association of uh, Nature and uh, Environment Protection in Tunisia. Uh, I'm currently in Kirwan. Uh, my city is uh, the the major the major problems in my city are uh, the uh, the worst management of waste that we can find waste uh, everywhere because of uh, the reasons are because uh, the uh, insufficient planning in waste ma management by uh, by the government or by the municipality so uh, they are uh, they, they can't they can't control uh, the costs of we, of uh, the costs which sometimes exceed 30 uh, 35 percent of the municip municipal's current expenses and uh, the loss, uh, the absence of uh, uh, vision of recycling waste. Uh, so uh, we can find also uh, a failure or to adapt means of collecting and transporting waste to uh, to uh, far areas from uh, outside the city. They are just taking uh, the waste, the trash from houses, and they collect them in uh, the South Sea area. So uh, this area is going to be uh, full of trash and can uh, produce uh, toxic ga gases and uh, it can cause also uh, air pollution. So uh, that's that make a very uh, very bad uh, weather to live in. So, uh, as an association, so we uh, we find not a good, but uh, it's not a very good solution. But we we are at the, at la at least we are uh, uh, participating the government to find some uh, solution to this waste management. So, uh, we have to uh, we uh, decided to make a strategy. A strategy to uh, waste um, waste management with this our project is named uh, is a developing of integrated and sus uh, sustainable management strategy for households and similar waste in the municipality of Kerwan. Our project 
starts with uh, studying the state of the city and uh, defining the problems in the first phase. The second phase is uh, defining a major orientations uh, to work on, uh, like uh, technical and organ organizational optimization of the waste management, cost, cost control and spending uh, the, financial, the own financial results of the government uh, or the municipality, and to involve citizens uh, in home uh, recycling. The last uh, phase of the project is to uh, make an action plan, uh, an action plan with uh, project, uh, 30, 30, uh, about 37 projects to organize and to, uh, to organize the work of municipality and to improve their, uh, their, their work to uh, reduce the waste in, in this in, in current. So, uh, also as uh, an organization, we we uh, we uh, we planned uh, cleanup days, and we uh, insist to integrate young people about aged about 30, uh, 13 and uh, seventeen years, and to make uh, cleanup days in uh, in the city. Uh, the last one was was in uh, last uh, June. Uh, the the event or the action was uh, was uh, in outside the the, the city uh, outside Kiron because we are in the middle of Tunisia we are not uh, near to the beach so well, we uh, planned an um, clean up the med an action uh, named uh, clean up the med uh, the group of young people as you uh, see in uh, the picture was uh, in the beach, and there they collected about uh, five kilos of uh, trash from the beach. So uh, here we are. Uh, the action was uh, aim aimed aimed to uh, raise awareness for for people and to integrate them and to encourage them to uh, participate and to make their uh, cities. Uh, clear and uh, and uh, and a good weather to live in and to make a good weather to live in thank you Kauter. Much appreciated. Um, for the sake, I know this is always the case with panel discussions. We have only about ten minutes left to talk about uh, and answer any questions. And with that, I'd like to open this up to <clears throat> our audience for questions and also entertain a few questions that we got during the registration process. So does anybody want to take the first step and ask questions of our panelists? And Ron, if you don't mind turning on your video and Anybody else, you don't have to, you can write it in the chat or you can just simply share your thought or your questions, please. <clears throat> and f why don't we, oh, there he, yeah, hello people, Baba. Let's see, do you, did you have a question? People, Baba, you're muted, I'm sorry. You're you're muted. Yeah, I don't have a question, but I learned a few things from the uh, learned quite a few things from the first two presentations. Um, uh, uh, yes, like you know, we do a lot of work, uh, but we didn't use the right language for it. Like right now, we are working on a landfill. Uh, uh, I would first like to do it and then, uh, you know, we are doing a two kilometer green belt on our landfill and we didn't have the right word for it. But in this presentation, I got the right language. I got the right vocabulary. And uh, that is the biggest thing that has happened. And uh, uh, I think some wonderful, wonderful presentation. The first presentation, I really made notes and uh, uh, I'm going to follow the panelists and uh, we've got to learn a lot from. 
I'll, I'll, I'll be seeing this uh, presentation. I'll be seeing this YouTube uh, video again and again, because there is a lot to learn from them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, People Baba. And people, for those that don't know, People Baba and his uh, is with the organization Give Me Trees Trust, also with our Delhi Urban Network. So thank you for that. Uh, before I turn this over to Agustina and Florencia, who have their hands up, I see um, from Destina a comment that landfill recycling and reuse and also reclaiming and restoring land degraded from mining was a great intervention for West Africa, especially Guinea and Ghana. Thank you for that. Agustina, you're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Ron. Before, there is like something really, I will say this is really new for me what uh, just uh, Ron give, um, present before. Like, it is make me like think I need to learn more after this. That's why, uh, Ron, maybe I don't have uh, questions, but I will say that I will learn more about what you just said today is really, really new for me and, and want to do more as well after that. So maybe in the future, like for me, myself, like not only working on, on doing this campaign, educate, and then also maybe one day um, I can do something like what you did today as well. So thank you for inspiring uh, people, young people like us. Um, really wonderful. Um, but I have no questions basically for Camila and Calder. Calder, apologies if the pronunciation is not right. So I know it's, it's not easy for us to work as a young people and have to, for example, like to take a lead or like, you know, to, 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 to hold the hand of government, municipality and all the communities. So I would love to know like, what is the biggest challenge that you face? when uh, I mean like you have been involving in this for so many years but I know that you work with the community and municipalities what is the biggest challenge that you face in your country and how you offer, overcome this challenge and for Jayan did you have uh, this uh, clean up uh, even and together at the same time as the same time that you combine two even like you know you have clean up but at the same time you have like plantation program together or you separate this project like in indifferent because you you know what like I, I was telling Lisa uh, like last year I think yeah or two years ago when I was planning to to lead the the five percent of population in Indonesia like which is like thirty million people to do clean up and at the same day like how we can plan for example thirteen uh, million uh, trees. Uh, on the same day after clean up. So everyone like, you know, not going home after clean up, but plant trees in, in where, where you do clean up. So this is also my, my, my plan. So it's good, Jayan, to, to, to hear from your side while you are also leading clean up. Thank you. Thanks, Agustina. And you had two questions. So let's start with Camilla first, then Kauter, and then Giant. Thank you for your question, Agustina. Um, thinking about the biggest challenges in our activities uh, I would say first is to get constant support there are a lot of people that will get involved in uh, doing compost for a day or two or maybe for a month but then how do you make that work constantly without anyone because they're mostly vo volunteers or people in the community that are already working six days a week and then you're asking them to work one more day composting so it is a challenge to 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 give the right incentives, I think, for people to to be more engaged constantly. And second, uh, another uh, issue maybe at the governmental level is bureaucracy. Uh, we we were we wanted to implement the wetlands in in one of these communities for the artificial wetlands for the pit latrines that they had, and. Um, we we weren't able to do it. I mean, we, we had the the budget, we, the community wanted it, but we were not able to do it because this was an informal settlement. And it was basically illegal to do a wetland there to treat the, the, the wastewater. So, so I think sometimes there is this uh, bureaucracy with, with laws that I know laws are necessary for, for the order. But the fact is that people is living there already for 20 years without water or sewage. And um, there is no, there are not many alternatives there. That's why we chose the dry toilets instead of the wetlands in that, that location. 
Uh, thank you, Camila. Um, Cotter, please, what are some of your the major challenges you overcome in getting people to to do some cleanups? You are muted. Cotter, you're muted. To do cleanup days, but in Carter, are you muted? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, Lila? Yes, you can. We can hear you. I think there's a little bit of a lag. Yeah. We do cleanup days. Yes, you can. We can hear you. Okay. You segregate between. Yeah. Okay. We do the cleanup days uh, to uh, encourage people to make their uh, segregation of trash in their home, uh, because uh, in Kerwin uh, we have 60% uh, of waste are organic, and about 20% uh, uh, plastic, plastic with trash. So uh, to uh, reduce. Uh, uh, to reduce uh, the quantity of waste, we encourage people to, to segregate their uh, their trash in ho at home and to uh, to make their compost for their gardens and uh, to um, uh, to collect plastic and to, we are trying to, and to uh, make them uh, some things useful. I think we have a little bit of a connection issue. I'm so sorry, Kauter. Um, why don't we, in the interest of time, um, let's move on to Jay and, and uh, address Agustina's question on tree planting at the same time as cleanup drives. Before you start, can I just put in, say something? Yes, please. Me? Oh, okay. Um, is that I live in Austin, Texas, and Austin has a fantastic composting from the uh, home program that was started up about four years ago, and it's been doing really well. So I put a link to a little bit of the information in the chat box. Thank you, Elizabeth. Jan, please, why don't we wrap up with you? So uh, thank you, Christina, for this question. So we usually do uh, both cleanup drive and plantation drive together. We plan to do uh, like together, but sometime happen when we have the strength of the volunteer low. So what we do for one week, like uh, we do plantation drive and then next week we come back to same place and do a cleanup drive. So we try to clean that place uh, wherever we are planting. Uh, it will also help to like maintain those trees. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we do a combination of both. Mostly we try to do, otherwise, we come back to that place and do anything. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Thank you. And I'm so sad that we are we have to stop now. Um, but I want to invite everybody again, if everybody is willing, to continue this discussion um, in the near future. I think it's a really important one. We can feature another expert. But Ron, we want you and Liz to be part of this discussion because we have questions for you. Um, if you want to see this video again, it'll be up on our YouTube channel. But I do want to thank everyone, our panelists, their passion, um, their leadership in their organizations and in their cities, and the expertise that they are bringing today. So again, I will send out another email. Hopefully, we can continue the discussion, um, and it won't be too long, because I really do believe that this is such an important topic. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Lisa. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thanks. Bye. Great job, everybody. Thank you.